Hello and welcome back. I'm so honored today to have two very special guests, Carolyn Worthy and Marcia Frazier. They're going to be talking to us about a wonderful uh, exhibit in our special collections department, honoring Black History Month. Welcome, and thank, thank you so you. much thank for you. coming. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And um, Carolyn, how did you get started in this? Well, uh, we got started months ago. Um, I think it was back in the spring when it was mentioned that suggested that we use the funeral programs since we already had a pretty good collection mm -hmm. and uh, do something with the funeral programs. So we uh, found some good pictures that would coordinate with the funeral programs. But it took several months to get all of this done. Well, thank you. Did you keep up with all your volunteer hours that you put in on this? <laughs> yeah, I can say, yes, we have kept up. And she is a star volunteer. Oh, she is. I would see her over in your department, Marcia, <laughs> just working away. Thank you so much on behalf of the library for what you did with this collection. Well, I think this is a very educational experience. I look forward to coming. Well, and Carolyn, we have so much fun doing it. Uh, Marcia, let's get a little bit of, sure. of background about uh, the exhibit. Is this the 21st, 20th year we've done let's this? Let's see, this is the 22nd, 22nd year, yes, 2018. And it's just a thrill for me to be a part of this. Uh, I've gotten to know Thelma very well over the last few years. And if it weren't for Thelma and her passion mm -hmm. for African American history in Williamson County and her ability to collect all of the information, the photographs, the genealogy information, the, the funeral programs, which Carolyn scanned, by the way. Carolyn digitized 1,300 funeral programs. And they're in books like this. But it's a thrill to be a part of this, and it is very difficult to pull out a select few pictures each year. Well, let's talk about that for just a minute. But before that, Thelma, when we, when we say Thelma, we're talking about Thelma Battle. Yes, that's great. We great. have several of her collections that we did, that we, we have at the library. This one focuses on uh, funeral brochures, but um, we've had several different themes. We've had sports. One theme we did right. recently, it was either last, maybe year before, was the Great Migration, mm -hmm. how that was affected African Americans in Williamson County. And I, that was special to me because mm -hmm. All, the Great Migration is a very important part of African American history, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people knows about it. So I think that's what makes this monthly, this annual monthly exhibit so important for us to do at the library and for people in Williamson County to know about it. So, uh, Marcy, you want to talk about the book a little bit? I would love to show you this book and maybe a couple of things in it. Uh, this is, we have five of these notebooks and about 1,300 programs plus in uh, overall. Mm -hmm. And we're looking, we're hoping to enlarge that collection. Um, I'd like to show you a couple of programs in here. One is the oldest program we have, and it's more of an announcement probably than a program. Uh, this is 1899, and this was uh, the, the program for Patrick Henry Southall, who died at age 40 years, three months and 18 days. See, I didn't know um, we had them that went back that far. There's another one, 1901, but the bulk of what we have would be from the 19, late 50s on to present day. Here's one of my favorites, and uh, Ms. Mitty Scruggs, Mitty Hughes Scruggs, or was it Hughes? Gentry. Gentry. Mitty Gentry Scruggs, Scruggs sorry. Um, I love the rustic hand drawing on this. She died in 1957, and I love what funeral programs tell us. 
I, let's just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I never thing. knew Mitty Scruggs. I never knew any of these folks in here, but I learned something about her on the opposite side. I, I learned that she was married to Mr. Forrest Scruggs, and it says here to this man, she was more than a wife. She was the lifeblood of his existence. Oh, that's wonderful. And it also says that her fruitful life in this community of Franklin stands out like the stars on a clear night. And the pall we Which, have a list of pallbearers, too. Yes. The, and that always helps because then that tells you who their friends, friends were, who exactly. maybe some of their relatives were. Well, the funeral programs give us information we just don't get anywhere else. And I know Carolyn can tell you more about this, but the information contained, they all contain an obituary. Mm -hmm. And that is just gold to future generations when they're searching for their family members. There are other things that are unique to African American funeral programs. Yes, and that's right. And you mentioned that um, it's a goal for genealogists. Uh, in some funeral programs, I've seen at least uh, four generations of people listed just right there in the and funeral that's program. that's so helpful. It is. And not only that, uh, they would give you the birth and death date. Of course, that's part of the obituary. But a lot of times the funeral program would say a home going. And for African Americans, that's special because uh, years back, um, the home going was meant that the person deceased was going back to the homeland of Africa. But in recent years, it means that it's just crossing over crossing to go over. to heaven. Right. See, I did not know that. Yes, that's well, wonderful. I didn't either. Uh, the burial date is on there, the mm -hmm. place of burial, of mm -hmm. course, the undertaker, uh, the flower girls, and this is similar to pallbearers. These would have been the friends or relatives of oh, the deceased, and the flower girl was responsible for retrieving the uh, the wreath uh -huh. after the ceremony. And if the cer if the cemetery was close by, they would carry the flowers to the grave. Uh, if the cemetery was a distance, they mm -hmm. would just put the flowers in the hearse. Uh, the name of the person officiating the funeral would be on the funeral program. I can see that would be important. Yes, uh, sometimes a favorite song that uh, the deceased mm -hmm. liked would be uh, sung at the services. Um, a lot of times, um, nurses. This is not. This is at the funeral. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say ushers would be present to. Um, kind of aid people who got emotionally overwhelmed, mm -hmm. they would be there. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The sunset and sunrise, that's kind of um, unique to uh, yes. African-American funeral programs. I saw a programs. lot of that right. when I walked around and, and looked at the... It's on the front the, yes. of each funeral program. Right. Yes. Sun, sunset. Sunrise and sunset. Yes. Right. Beginning and end. And some wonderful poetry. Exactly. In, yes. In That's in too. most of the programs. There, there's some poetry. Right. Um, well, how is a theme decided... You know, I was mentioning earlier that we have different themes right. every year. So, Marcia, well, tell us a little bit about how the themes are decided. Well, I have to give full credit to <laughs> Jason Gavin for this theme because he had been Special Collections Librarian until last March. So mm -hmm. he was already thinking in terms of what are we doing next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I took his position and he moved on into administration, he came to me and said, you know... I just think it would be great to pair up the funeral programs and bring them out, let people see the funeral programs and see what we have here, and perhaps it would help you to publicize and enlarge the collection we have because they are truly gold. It was a fun project to do. It did take longer, mm -hmm. uh, matching up people with pro or families. Some we, we exhibited in family groups. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it took a little bit longer, but it was it's just full of information. And the exhibit itself is getting a lot of attention. The folks who are coming to see it really seem to be enjoying it and finding the material very meaningful. Now, some of the special people 
that we have shown in the exhibit uh, is most is someone most people in Williamson County knows, mm -hmm. and that's Tommy Murdoch. So, and I s noticed that you brought some of uh, some of that to show, and uh, let's let the viewers see that this smile never changed from Tommy Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> and you and I just found out before we started working on this taping that you are related. I am related to Tommy. His mother and my mother were sisters, uh, Minerva Bright and Minerva Owen Bright and Jane o Jane Okris Owen Murdy uh, were sisters. My mother was the the older. Um. You also have, in the Special Collections area, a video uh, documentary we that do. is running. Tell us a little bit about that, Marcel. We do, uh, Dolores. That was another fun project that I participated in during the summer. And I, I did that with my son, who is a filmmaker. Um, what it turned out to be is more of an oral history mm -hmm. interview. But on the film, we have Thelma, Rick Warwick, and Mary Pierce. And they are there to talk about Thelma's work. Thelma's talking about her work, and she's remembering the old times in Franklin. She's She talks about how she came to be involved with African American history and the J. Paul Getty scholarship that she received to go to a, a huge conference in Boston that really uh, got her going on this. <laughs> and so it's very informative video, and we're just we've got it playing in the special collections department during February during this exhibit, and hopefully you'll be able to see it on WCTV as well. Um, the exhibit runs through February. That's right. So the hours at the library is open, so anyone that wants to come by can see it. Now, the notebooks, one which you brought, that is available for people to see all the time as part of our special yes. collections. Yes, they And are. so you can come and... Uh, Take a look at that and all of the other treasures that Thelma has been working on all these years. And Dolores, if I may, I'd like to add that all of this is digitized. We have, here's our poster girl, Laura <laughs> May Hughes Benier, and we have what all the pictures picture. digitized. They have all been assigned a number. All of the funeral programs are digitized, and what that means is we can print these out for you. If someone comes in, we can find them easily and print them out. We have a master index. We've got all of the captions in Thelma Battle's original catalog books. Um, so you get the full package. That's wonderful. So plan some time. Don't, don't just dart in and out. Put a date on your calendar. Come in and look through this collection and exhibit because it's wonderful. Thank and you. not only uh, Carolyn and Marcia, thank you for being here today, but thank you for all the hard work done on this collection. Thank You're you, Dolores, thank and you thank you for so your much. help and support. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Brightworthy and I'm a volunteer at the Williamson County Library in Franklin in the Special Collections area. Uh, for this month, for Black History Month, we'll be featuring uh, the theme, Lest We Forget. And this is a collection of funeral programs collected by Thelma Battle. And it's important for us not to forget those African Americans who were significant, who have passed away who make significant contributions to their family and community. Uh, the exhibit features numerous pictures and funeral programs of people throughout Middle Tennessee, basically the Franklin, Williamson County area. But there's one special person that I'd like to present, and that is my mother, uh, Minerva Owen Bright. And I'd just like to say a few words about her. Uh, she was born November the 15th, 1919, uh, in Marshall County, Tennessee, to the parentage of Roy and Ari Owen. Uh, she passed away on November the 8th, 
uh, 2007, so she was a week shy of her 88th birthday. She was married to Alexander Bright Jr., my father, who passed away suddenly in uh, 1984. Uh, so he has been dead for over 20 years. Uh, they were the parents of three children, uh, me, my younger sister, Barbara, and my older brother, uh, my only brother, uh, Didi, and his name was really Alexander, but we all called him Didi. So now I'd like to just say a few words about my mother. A few months before our mother passed away, she said to me and my sister, I haven't done anything with my life. Without hes hesitation, we replied, we turned out pretty good. You taught us to be hard workers, independent, and to stay out of trouble, and to be good citizens, so you must have done something right. Without a lot of formal education, we thought that she had indeed accomplished a great deal. Our mother had many talents. For example, she was an excellent cook, housewife, mother, grandmother, offered many pearls of wisdom, influenced others around her, and was an avid reader. However, her passion was gardening. Therefore, I will compare my mother's life and our rearing to her gardening skills. First of all, during the winter months, she began to plan and prepare for her garden. What seeds or bulbs she wished to plant? What did she need to do to amend the soil to have it right for planting? And how did she want to design the garden? In addition, she perused her saved seeds from the previous year. Our mother had numerous books on gardening and did her own research. Therefore, we knew that she valued education. I'm now in my third year curriculum as a Master Gardener of Williamson County. Numerous skills that, skills that I'm learning, my mother already knew as she was self-taught. For example, she was aware that one needed to determine the pH level of the soil in order to improve it. So she did her own litmus test or sent a soil sample to the county lab for evaluation. She also was knowledgeable regarding how to make compost. She knew the value of deadheading, mulching, and allowing the foliage of buttercups to die naturally. So when these particular things were reviewed in the class, I'd say to myself, that's what my mother did, or my mother taught me how to do that. She was indeed a master gardener. So my mother thought we needed to plan and prepare to have a good life. Therefore, she encouraged us to achieve, to get an education, to be thrifty, and to always do our best. Second, she always followed through and took care of her garden. She planted, watered, fertilized, weeded, deadheaded, pruned as needed. Also, our mother took great care of us. She nurtured, encouraged, provided discipline, sometimes without even saying a word, just giving us that look. We called it the mean eye. And if we did not stop what we were doing, the consequences were not going to be pretty. As in her garden she weeded, she did not allow everything to grow in her garden. As with her garden, she instilled in us not to let everyone in our lives and to be informed about our friends and associates. She often told us, if I were you, I wouldn't get too thick with that person. You really do not know him or her. Third, through gardening, our mother often faced many challenges from the heat, humidity, and insects. She related, it's a jungle out there. And of course, she was right. However, this did not stop her. She kept going, watering, weeding, fertilizing, doing whatever was needed to have a beautiful garden. Through this experience, she instilled in us to not give up in the face of adversity and to keep trying. Our mother always said, hard work pays off. And of course, it does. Next, she did, took great pride in creating her garden, showing it off with all its beautiful flowers and feeling a sense of accomplishment. Therefore, the lesson we learned from this was to take pride in whatever we were doing to gain that sense of accomplishment and to finish whatever we started. Finally, our mother left a legacy through her gardening, something that we will always remember her by. She often shared the fruits of her labor with family members, friends, and many neighbors, dividing her plants, giving away beautiful bouquets of flowers, or seeds, or bulbs. She often said, plants grow better when they are divided and shared with others. So she also passed on her love of gardening to several family members. So we always believe that our mother left the world a little better than it was when she entered it. Thank you.
Thelma Bottle has been a real uh, boon to this community and county because she has been kind of the, the sole person in the African American community gathering historical facts, photographs, and even legends in that community that I don't think uh, I could acquire. You have to know people before they'll share, and Thelma had an inside that not anyone else that I know of would have. We've worked on many projects together. I guess I have probably done more uh, groundwork with her than anyone. We've helped each other. We've served on the board at the uh, McLemore House and the African American Heritage Society. She and I served as historians for that group. Recently, I helped her with the Natchez Street book, Natchez Street Revisited, Volume 1. Her material is really grassroots level. She, you know, she has a good way with words and she knows what she wants. She knows her people that she's talking about and the ones she's writing for. People coming here to do research, Thelma has gone out of her way to show them what to look for, where to go, and, and provided their link back into the family in bondage, which is a difficult thing, but because Thelma knows the records that's in the archives and where to find them, and she has a good memory of putting families together and their connections, and so she's really been an asset that I, not many people would know how important that is for people coming here, tracing, trying to trace their roots. Thelma Battle and I have been friends for years and years. We share a love for history, her saving African American history documents, and me more trying to save the built environment. But Thelma cares about the built environment too. Thelma said, Mary, Habitat's getting ready to build a house here, and we've got to make a deal, and you've got to buy the house. And I said, Thelma, I think you're right about everything you're telling me except one thing. I said, it would just be horrible for me to own this house. I said, I really believe it's a community treasure. Thelma and I got to investigating and found out that as far as we know, it was the first house built by a free slave. We started setting up meetings with uh, Habitat for Humanity and I think at the first meetings, they kind of thought, you know, we got us two crazy women here. But as things went along and a few community meetings later, uh, they decided that the right thing for them to do was to sell this part of the property uh, to someone to save the house. The Heritage Foundation bought the house and were given a grant from the state of Tennessee, and um, there, there you have it. If you're not saving everybody's history, you're really not telling your community story. And we have been so blessed to have Thelma Battle make her life's work to be to save African American history and to care about this precious place and all the stories it saved. My name is Thelma Battle. I'm an African American preservationist and historian. I am a founder of the African American Heritage Society and a founder of the African American Museum. I have uh, worked with several people throughout the county, black and white, as far as preserving the history of Williamson County and not just the black race, but black and white. I would uh, like to say that I consider myself a determined person, a strong person, and successful person. And as I had said before, 
Success is not measured by what you have accomplished, but what you had to go through to get there. Success is not always, it's not always measured by material things. I mean, I may not have the riches that some would expect me to have on this earth, but there are riches in heaven. And that is what I am st striving for at this time. Some of the influences in my young life was years ago, I was able to uh, win a J. Paul Getty scholarship and travel to Boston, Massachusetts to the National Heritage Preservation Conference. And during that time, there were representatives of people interested in heritage preservation from all over the United States. And there was a remarkable group of African Americans who were able to come together within that circle and uh, exchange notes as well. And one night during the time that I was there, I was able to go to the uh, Massachusetts Slave House. Now, they had a tent up outside with a reception for the attendees, but the upstairs was actually closed, so we was down stairs, stairs like in the basement or something of the slave house. But <clears throat> the feeling that I experienced that night made me come away with some kind of yearning to do something back in my hometown of Franklin to let people know the experiences that the, the atrocities that African Americans had gone through in this country and how it should not be forgotten and the story should be told. There was a black lady from Covington, Kentucky there in the huge meeting hall at this center where we were having the conference and the ones that was interested in certain uh, lectures, you know, signed up to go, but she was in a lecture hall and it seemed like maybe a couple of hundred people, a uh, hundred people at least were, were there and she stood up and told a story about <clears throat> how life was in Covington, Kentucky, but before she told it, she stood up and she told her name and she says, and I have a story to tell. And I came back to Franklin and I told people what I had uh, experienced there. And I just had this desire that uh, we could have a museum, in Fr African American museum in Franklin. So I didn't let up. I went to Mary Pierce, I went to Rick Warwick. Those two people were great influences in me going as far as I have within this uh, preservation uh, quest. And they were able to get other people together. And uh, we all came to get together with a common bond of trying to put together uh, something to preserve and protect African American history in Williamson County. Because of the atrocities of slavery and human beings being sold like they were cattle or horses or whatever, uh, babies torn from their mothers, little children uh, sent uh, away, not knowing uh, actually who they were. A lot of them didn't even know their 
parents' name, first names, vaguely they might uh, remember what someone else had called them by their first name, but uh, they were sold and didn't know what state they were living in if they were very young. And so they were sold elsewhere and they were, it will be hard to ever piece those families together except by DNA. I would, if more people would uh, have their DNA done, they could probably find out where the, who their Kendrick is at this time. But uh, it's very hard. You run into so many brick walls, African Americans, because of being sold and uh, not knowing how to go back any further. I, I can't describe the urgency I have instilled in people of, of trying to reach out to the older people and get everything that they can, knowledge about the history from them, even as much as photographs. If they have old photographs, sit down with the older people and ask them who are these people on these pictures and write on the back so that when they're dead and gone, you will know who those people are and not throw the pictures out. So many older African Americans pass and what do you think happened? People come in, look at the photographs. I don't know who all these old folks are and out they go in the trash instead of of trying to see if a preservationist would be interested in taking them, they throw the pictures out into the trash because they don't know who they are. Because of slavery, African Americans were not allowed to read, not allowed to write, not allowed to attend churches. And if they did attend church, they went with their owners. They were made to sit in the balcony or on a back pew. They, the churches that they attended were very subdued in the way they expressed themselves in church. Uh, African Americans were treated so poorly that some African-American slaves would hide out at night in the bushes and get an old tub and turn it over to hide the sound of them worshiping, singing, and praying the best way they could. So when they were allowed to have their own churches, they rejoiced and made joyful noises. They didn't sit in church and not say amen. Uh, many of them were treated so badly and wasn't allowed to uh, talk back. And when they got in, in their churches, they were so filled up with all this anguish, they let it out and they shouted and they sung praises. So people still do that today. And it's not just the black, churches, some white churches I've seen on TV, they express themselves in, in worship the same way. But uh, the black AME church, we have one here in uh, Franklin down on Natchez Street. They were treated so badly that one of the Bishop Allen was able to found the AME church because they were tired of being made to sit in the back and not express themselves at all within their worship. That is the stories that I have heard since I was very young. The, the church that uh, the church that, that moved from down on uh, Church Street became known as the Shorter Chapel AME Church on Natchez Street. Is that the Shorter Chapel still there today? It's still there today. When they moved, 
1925 from the older church that they had on Church Street, which had originally been owned by uh, the white uh, population. And during the Civil War, it served as a hospital, and then the blacks were able to acquire it as a AME church. But in 1925, they moved to uh, Natchez Street. Some African American church churches uh, did not allow music for a number of years, and to this day, uh, there are some churches that doesn't have musical instruments. African American churches don't have musical instruments, and that is the uh, Church of Christ here in Franklin. But uh, some churches have tambourines and guitars and organ, pianos, and drums. Now, I attend First Missionary Baptist Church, and we have a pianist, an organist, uh, a drummer, and uh, sometimes a tambourinist, a person who just is in the choir, but they keep beat, you know, with the music. So it's just a variety of ways that uh, m most people in general worship. Around the time that the Saturn plant came to uh, Tennessee, we had several African American uh, people c coming to the South looking for places to worship and quite a few of them uh, came to our church and became members. One of the people who came south uh, was, uh, became our church minister. He was not employed at the, by the Saturn plant, but he worked for a tool and dye company that contracted out of the Saturn plant. And we elected him to be our minister and uh, his name was Reverend R. L. Denson. And because of him, I wanted, and all of the other members who had uh, joined that came, you know, so many of them came from the Saturn plant and they didn't know anything about the history here in Franklin, I asked the past if it was okay if I put together a book to let them know more about uh, the city of Franklin and the church members uh, who were already there. Because one Sunday he had said, Reverend Denson had said, I believe everybody in Franklin is kin to one another. So I did this book in a way that would let him know who within the church was related to each other, and he was very grateful that I was able to uh, to put this book together on the First Missionary Baptist Church, and it was in 1991, and it was taking a look at our history, church, family, friends as related to lifestyles. And at the time that it was printed, I had asked one of the older members of uh, Mrs. Ellie's parish if uh, she would uh, write the introduction for me, and she did. And I wrote the dedication and did not sign my name when it was printed. If I may, I'd like to read this. This is a dedication that I wrote in 1991. This dedication is dedicated to our pastor, Reverend R.L. Denson, and his wife, Leela Denson. They are tender and gentle souls whose creed is Christ. They struggle continuously for the simple recognition of human dignity and Christian love. And for these divine acts, we are grateful. As Northerners relocating to a Southern state Reverend and Mrs. Denson may have found some adverse regional differences, but we Southerners have showered them with our known hospitality and family traditions and love. 
Reverend Denson is quoted as once stating that he believed that all black people in Franklin are blood related because every time I meet someone, they're related to so-and-so. It is only fitting then that this year's Black History Month be celebrated here by presenting a brief historical handbook of Franklin's First Missionary Baptist Church family and a few friends and neighbors. As Christians, we are aware that no matter how circumstances may appear, our security is rooted in God's unlimited power and unfailing love, and that we must begin caring more for one another than we do for things. Our history gives us a vision of what is possible if we have love. Reverend and Mrs. Denson, we love you. Sincerely, Thelma Battle, researcher, organizer, 1991 of this book. Years ago, Locust Ridge was a very rural church. It was way out in College Grove on a very rural road, and it was uh, unless you lived in the area, it was a hardship for people getting there, but one dedicated uh, church member that I strongly remember was Mrs. Frances Burns. She was uh, married to Mr. Felix Burns, and they lived here in town. And when the membership at Locust Ridge was dwindling, Miss Frances Burns would fill her church up with young kids in Franklin and that wasn't attending church anywhere. And she'd fill her car up and take them to church on Sundays and take them to the Wednesday night or whatever night Bible studies they were having. And when those children grew up, they joined. And to this day, they still continue to go with their children and their grandchildren are still attending Locust Ridge. Now, I attended a church in rural Brentwood on Crockett Road with my mother when I was a child, and it was called Holt's Church because of the plantation owners, Will Holt and John Holt, and also the Edmondson family owned part of the property there. So sometimes it was known as Holt's Church, and sometimes it was known as Ed Edmondson Chapel Church. And anyway, the, uh, the, the host church shared their church with a denomination of Primitive Baptists. Host church was a missionary Baptist. And a Little Harper Church that uh, also shared the same building, they were Primitive Baptists, and, which meant they washed feet. And so two Sundays a month, Host Church worshiped in the building, and two Sundays a month, uh, Little Harper's congregation worshiped in, in the building. But later, the Little Harper denomination wanted to have uh, church services four Sundays instead of two, and they bought property in Franklin, Tennessee, on Green Street, and presently they are under the direction of uh, Reverend Coors. And he has uh, been wonderful in keeping the church going and, and growing. And they have a dining hall in the back that he built and they uh, raise money by having fish and chitlins and, and soul food on the weekends in the summertime, and sometime in the wintertime. Yes, I would like to mention Casey Springs. Casey Springs, uh, it actually was a, a place where tourists would come from all over to come out there and, uh, you know, bathe in the waters, drink the waters, but there was a Pope, a white plantation owner that uh, came over to Tennessee, I want to say from Virginia, and uh, he brought some of his slaves. And to this day at Casey Springs, 
there are African American descendants of the popes still out there. It's, it's several of them still own property out near Casey Springs uh, Road in Thompson Station. Do you find that to be true of other areas like um, where there were large plantations uh, that the people have stayed in a place um, that they identify with that place or have you found much movement? Um, there was yeah, there was much mo movement where the African Americans had settled, where the plantation owners were, say down near the Governor's Club on the Concord Road near Crockett Road. Uh, the Holt family owned, uh, his two brothers, Will Holt and John Holt, they were plantation owners. One owned property uh, on Crockett, well they both owned Crockett, property on Crockett Road, but one of the brothers' property went over to uh, Concord Road. And uh, those uh, black people that lived there called it the Holtz Village. And there were several, when I was young, there was a child, there were several members of the black Holt families that owned property in that area. But now, they own property up there where Liberty Church Road is now. And now when you go up in there and you see these multi-million dollar homes, you would not ever imagine that the Black uh, Holtz and, and uh, Stanfields own property all up in, I mean, it was so beautiful when I was a child to, uh, to uh, see there was uh, one distant cousin named Annabelle uh, Stanfield who married Eugene Holt. And then there was uh, Henry Stanfield who had several acreages. And he, he was uh, a brother to uh, Annabelle. And then there was Laura uh, Holt who owned property in between, and it was just several acres of land near an old church out there. But, but the younger generation was either talked out of it or lost it. I am a descendant on my grandmother's side from the Hamer family who uh, were slaves down there near that property. And so I'm, that's why I'm familiar with uh, that property. There's a, a cemetery, Hamer Cemetery, there on off of Concord Roads that's in a subdivision, and it sits between two huge homes. And there was always a right of way to get up into the cemetery, but the last owner that bought the property closed up the the right of way, and. Uh, you can't even get a hearse up in there now. There have been people trying to find and define these old slave cemeteries. There was uh, a lady who came to the library about four or five months ago, and she was white, and she was in the process of trying to identify the people who were buried within the cemetery in Brentwood, Tennessee. But there are people out there that's uh, trying to preserve and protect these old cemeteries. We just don't have enough uh, people who are willing to get out in the trenches and, and, and do the legwork that needs to be done in preserving African American history. And those of us who have been doing it for so many years we're tired and we welcome younger people to come in and, and take the torch and carry it on. I myself was standing on so many other people's shoulders that uh, uh, it's, uh, but that's life. And, and I was told that success is not uh, measured by what you have accomplished but what you have to go through to get there. 
and sometimes it might mean crawling on your belly a long, long way. And Natchez High School stayed open until 1967. And that was the last class that graduated uh, from as a high school, but the county used it as part of Franklin High School where they were busing some of the black and white kids back over into the Natchez uh, High School. And of course, a lot of the white parents didn't want their children coming over in that part of town to uh, a school like that. So it was probably officially closed in 68. Natchez High School was located on Natchez Street. It had previously been known as Franklin Training School, but some of the teachers and parents got together and said, we do not accept the name Franklin Training School because so many black schools within uh, Middle Tennessee is known as training schools and not high schools, and we want different. So uh, they came up with a name and they named it after the street. And that's how it got its name. We did not have things as nice as the high schools. It's supposed to have been separate but equal, and it was never separate but equal. It was an old raggedy school where the teachers did the best they could with what they had. We never had the new books. We'd get the books from the other schools, the white schools. The football equipment came from uh, BGA and and other places wherever they could get the football equipment from. It was a drafty school. It was, I mean, I, I cannot begin to explain. There's so many other people that know more, more than I do on this subject, but no, it was never a separate but equal facility. Had it been, there would probably would not have been a pressing need for uh, the integration per se because they would have had the decent, the same privileges within their own school. There was only one high school in Williamson County for African American students and that was the high school on Natchez Street. And so the county students, when they graduated from the eighth grade, if they didn't have transportation to get to Franklin to attend school on Natchez Street, they had to cut short their education. That was it. And a lot of parents of young girls did not want to allow them to board in Franklin because they would be, you know, out of their uh, eyesight, but there were some trusted people within the community that many of the parents of uh, students from all over the county, these parents trusted some of these people in the community to let their daughters come and board and uh, stay from Monday to, to Friday maybe and come home and then they would bring them back on a Sunday night to Franklin where they could wake up and go to school and here in the city once again. But I in, in the book, Raining in the House and Leaking Outdoors, there were quite a few elderly ladies who said they could not attend high school because after the eighth grade, they, there were no buses for blacks. They had buses for whites, but there were no buses for blacks to attend high school. There was uh, some people down on the Hillsborough Road who were trying to get to school and their parents went to the superintendent and he arranged for them to get some kind of passage to ride the interurban bus. But, uh, 
that wasn't that was accommodated only them on on that Hillsborough Road, but there were students all over the county, black students who who needed transportation. So eventually, it was up to the black people to to raise funds and purchase the first bus in order for blacks to get the same kind of high schooling that the whites were getting. The community leaders during that time of trying to get those school buses was the Northern family on, that, that lived in the Hillsborough Road area. The Miss Charlotte Northern was said to have six or seven sons in the, in the war. At one time, she had several children and uh, just to think that our children couldn't get to attend a high school because there was no buses uh, for them, but it was the Northern family, the Lawrence family, and the Bright family from down in that area. They were leaders in the Kennard. The Kennard family were the leading families, Kennards, Northerns, Brights, and uh, they were the ones that uh, spearheaded getting that first school bus out there on, on their route. Well, my knowledge of the integration of high schools, they had uh, asked if anyone was interested in, in integrating the schools and some students uh, wanted to and some didn't and the ones that didn't, their parents, you know, encouraged them to go ahead and, and try to uh, integrate. So my knowledge was that uh, it worked out. It worked out in Franklin other places they had mobs and and injuries and stuff but that didn't uh, happen in Franklin as far as people throwing bricks and and uh, blocking the entrance to the schools but uh, things did happen that were not uh, talked about in such a way so I was kind of shocked when I was told some of the stories. The younger generation, they are introduced to a different society than people of my age were. They are open to a world of, of technology where a lot of times no one took the time to tell them of how things were for blacks. And so they took so much for granted uh, until recently and they didn't, they, they didn't know that there was differences, such differences made between blacks and whites because they didn't experience it and nobody took time to explain it to them. But uh, slowly they are beginning to see what uh, the older people had experienced, you know, so long ago. And the young people don't uh, respect uh, elderly people enough and unless Sometimes their parents take extra time in explaining it to them, and the churches are doing wonderful jobs in uh, having the younger people uh, learn about the elderly people and how to show uh, respect for them. And so really the elderly people have to show themselves to the younger people in a respectful way in order to gain respect. So it, it's a different uh, world and they don't have time to sit down and talk to an elderly person. Not all of them, but just a few. They don't have time to sit down and talk because there's too many other things out there in the world 
available to them and they don't want to to miss that. Why? They would think, why you want me to sit around and talk to that old person for? I've got to uh, go here and go there and do this. And, and so somewhere two, at least two generations were not schooled enough. There's not nearly enough young people that sees the collection and they, I can't say how they feel, but a couple of years ago when I was uh, doing a history class at my church for the youth leadership for Franklin that, uh, that uh, has a history month every year when they have a new class, there was one black girl within this group of teenagers and I was telling the history of the black people in Franklin and I looked and she was crying and so I got up and went to her and I put my arm around her and uh, she said I never heard that before nobody ever told me this and it was so moving that um, I just wanted to try even harder to get the story out to young people because she was an honor student, but no one had had ever told her the history of blacks in Franklin. She was born in Franklin, and she didn't know the world, the history of blacks in general. I mean, some people don't believe that the Holocaust ever happen and there's the the signs everywhere so some people d don't believe slavery was a, a bad thing uh, they think slaves were happy all the time happy-go-lucky smiling even lazy how can you be happy and how can you be lazy do you have time to be tired? You work until you die. That was what it was about. Worked until work killed you, and that's what they expected of you.